uh, uh, Trophy Club Texas. But uh, I want to welcome everyone to the Pro Football of Fame. My name is Jerry Shockey, and I oversee all the youth and educational programs here at the Pro Football of Fame. And it's it's great to connect out, especially with all these Ohio schools. And uh, uh, we appreciate your participation in this Heart of the Hall of Famer series. Now, I know there are some schools that are new to this series and some that are kind of veterans, but I think all the students are probably new to this. Uh, just so you know, the real idea and premise behind the Heart of the Hall of Famer series is to convey exactly what it took to get in the Hall of Fame beyond just the athletic ability. Uh, we, you know, we know that Mr. Eller and the other members of the Pro Football Hall of Fame are great examples of athleticism. And we know that uh, obviously the guy given ability was in pro football, but at the core of what they do and what made them successful and what's made most of our guys, just about all of them, you could say, uh, in some way, shape, or form, have been very successful, if not more successful, off the field than they were on the field. Uh, at the core of that, that allowed them to be successful, was their character. And I know you all are studying the six core pillars of character, the trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness, caring, and citizenship. And we'll dive into those a little bit here today throughout the remarks. And I know you guys will have some questions about those. Uh, but those are at the core uh, of our Hall of Famers. Uh, and, you know, so those are at the core for you guys, whether it's to be a great football player or whether you want to go on to be a, a you know, a great parent, a great spouse, uh, a great plumber, a great pastor, a great whatever it might be that you want to do in life. Those are going to be at the core uh, to making you successful. So uh, thank you for all of you tuning in. What I'd like to do is recognize the individuals that have made this possible because there's a, it's taken a, a team of people to make this possible. So we'd like to recognize those. And first and foremost, as you guys can see uh, when uh, Mr. Eller speaks, that you see some students gathered around. That's in New Hope, Minnesota. Uh, so we need to thank our folks at Robbinsville School District at Cooper High School. Thank you for opening your doors to allow Mr. Eller uh, to come into your classroom and connect out the students from all across the country. So uh, Christian King and Jane Prestebeck and the, the administration there, uh, thank you for, for the opportunities, uh, this opportunity and the one earlier. Uh, without you guys, it wouldn't have been possible. Uh, we have to again thank our friends at ETEC Ohio, uh, uh, Paul and Mark and, and uh, Josh and, and Dave and all the folks there. They're the ones that are putting this connection together through our State Department of Education, so thank you. Thank you to the teachers. You know, there's a lot of folks involved with each one of these programs for each school district. There could be the tech coordinator. There could be the actual classroom teacher. There could be the coordinator of the video conferencing program. There's a number of different folks that are involved with making these possible, and it takes planning on your part to do so. So thank you very much for, for, for doing that. And last but definitely not least, we need to thank the students, because as we, with previous programs, you all are going to be the ones driving the program today. Uh, you know, Mr. Eller has some opening remarks that he would like to share with you guys here, and we'll get to those here in just a moment. But you are the ones that are going to be asking the questions. You are the one that's done the preparation. You're going to be asking great questions about character and about advice and things like that. Uh, so I want to thank you all for the preparation that you've done at, in order to make this program successful, because it's not successful uh, without you guys. So thank you very much. And with that being said, what I'd like to do is give each school district a chance to uh, give a little shout out, as uh, I think our friends at, uh, I forget if it was Keystone or Bria, that kind of kind of already gave a shout out once. We'll give you guys another chance to do that here in just a minute. So maybe you can top your last cheer that you just did. But uh, what we'll do is I'll ask each school as I call upon them to unmute their microphone. Feel free to show a little school spirit, a little shout out uh, for your school, and then go ahead and mute your microphone. Uh, right after that. So we'll start uh, right there with Mr. Eller, the students that are in there. If you want to give a little shout out, go ahead. Hey. 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 I think, I think your, your classroom before he out, outperformed you. So you want to try that again? Yeah. One, two, three, yeah. go. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I, I know you don't want to you don't want to hurt Mr. Eller's ears and yell in, yell in front of him. So that's understandable. They're being very respectful there at uh, Robbinsdale. Uh, let's go to uh, some of our Ohio schools here. Let's go to Berea, Berea High School. Yeah. Thank you, Berea. Thank you very much. And let's go to Keystone and LaGrange, Ohio. Yeah. Thank you, Keystone. Very, I like that, though. It's very quick and it's cut right at the end. You guys like a choir or something in there? 
No, but we can sing if you want to. Uh, sure, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's go to Lake Catholic. <laughs> It's, it's Friday. They got the uh, ties on, so I'm guessing that might be a, an athletic team, maybe a football team there, I'm guessing. So uh, thank you very much, Lake Catholic. Uh, let's go to Lorain County JVS in Overland, Ohio. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> I like the one at the end, the little cheer at the end there from someone. Thank you very much, Lorain County. And last but definitely not least, let's go to Cuyahoga Valley Career Center in Brecksville. And Brexville, we're having a little audio issue. I don't know if that, that was on your end or not, but uh, uh, we're getting a little cut out there. So just so you know, we'll, maybe we'll, we'll see if that happens when we go to the rounds of questions. So we'll check that here in just a moment. But uh, with that being said, what I would like to do is go ahead and introduce uh, our, our esteemed speaker today, Mr. Carl Eller. And let me... Let me uh, read a little information about his background, and, and we like to outline our, our Hall of Famers both on and off the field. So on the field, he was selected in the first round of the NFL draft by the Minnesota Vikings and by the AFL draft by the Buffalo Bills. Some of you may or may not know that during the 60s, there was an AFL and an NFL. They merged in 1970 and became the AFC and NFC as we know it uh, today. Uh, obviously, he chose the Minnesota Vikings, if you've done the research on him. Quickly established himself at left defensive end on the Vikings' famed, some of you might have heard this before, the Purple People Eaters defensive line. Excellent at stopping the run and a devastating pass rusher. From 1975 to 1977, before it was really an official statistic, he amassed 44 sacks over those three seasons. Uh, he was named first or second team All-NFL each season from 1967 through 1973. He played in six Pro Bowls, and then in 2004, Mr. Rowell was bestowed with the highest honor that an individual player can receive, and he was enshrined into the Pro Football Hall of Fame here in Canton, Ohio. Many of the schools here are familiar with the Hall of Fame or may have visited here before because you know, most of you are within a 60 or 70 mile radius of here, many of the Ohio schools. Um, but off the field, you'll find that he's done as much, if not more, off the field. And I think if you're, if you're thinking about the pillars, uh, you know, really pay attention to the pillars of uh, the six pillars of character. Really pay attention to the words uh, citizenship and caring, because I think you'll you'll see those throughout some of the things that he has done off the field. He's become one of the most sought-after speakers on brain damage and head, head injuries that may cause dementia, Alzheimer's, and the National Football League retirees. As the founder and president of the Retired Players Association. He fights for those who have fallen on hard times due to medical, psychological, or personal problems that affect their quality of life. Retired Players Association founder and president Carl Eller is now in a position to help former players from the National Football League gain access to much-needed medical care and improve pension benefits. Since his days as a consultant for the National Football League, he has gained national attention as a leader in the field of providing care and treatment for the National Football League, not only current players, but obviously retired players as well. Many of his programs are in use in the NFL today and in sports leagues all around the world. Carl is a private citizen and as a leader of the Retired Players Association, is active in his community and nationally in green and environmental movements that are invested in sensitive environmental cleanup issues, including redeveloping foreclosed properties on the north side of Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. He's a small business entrepreneur the big business attitude. Carl says, my goal is to maintain the integrity and preserve the character of our urban areas while improving the quality of life uh, for its citizens. Uh, so before we ask Mr. Eller with his opening remarks, what I'm going to do is we're going to switch over you, you, to our, our quick video highlight of Mr. Eller on the field. A consensus All-American at the University of Minnesota, Carl Eller was the Vikings' first-round draft pick in 1964. Number 81 proved worthy of his high draft status, becoming an integral part of Minnesota's famed Purple People Eaters. A member of the 1970s All-Decade team, Eller was elected to six Pro Bowls and named first or second team All-NFL-NFC seven times. 
all the schools can join me at, uh, here and unmute your microphones for a second and join me in giving a warm round of applause to Pro Football Hall of Famer, Mr. Carl Eller. Mr. Eller, the, uh, the microphone is yours first. Let me remind all the schools real quick. Uh, make sure you keep your microphones muted until we call upon you. And the stage is yours, sir. Well, Jerry, thank you uh, for having me, and I want to thank you and the Hall of Fame and the Heart of the Hall of Famers program for having me as your guest today. It's it's really a, a nice, it's an honor to be here, and also to be here at Cooper High School, which is actually not far from me. I, I live, uh, you know, not very far from here at Cooper High School, so I'm very familiar with it, and uh, they've got a big weekend coming up here. It's their homecoming, and so we see a lot of orange around here, but... Uh, they have been very gracious to uh, have me in their school today. Uh, again, the heart of the Hall of Fame, we were talking about the uh, pillars of character. I think that those things are closer related to uh, some of the values that I've had and held uh, dear to me uh, uh, throughout my football career and, and throughout life. <clears throat> Jerry, I know we were trying to separate, okay, the football from the, from the uh, life after football. <clears throat> And uh, certainly there is a big distinction between the two, but I believe that a lot of what I learned on the football field and through playing football and athletics and with teams, those have been the things that I've brought with me beyond football. You know, things like uh, responsibility, uh, citizenship, uh, caring, uh, 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 those kinds of things that stay with you. So you don't just develop these things and, and leave them on the field. <clears throat> I, I think that these have been some real strong uh, uh, values for me that have helped me be successful off the field. So um, uh, those are the kinds of things I'm hoping we'll get a chance to share today, and, and I'm looking forward to uh, answering the questions and, and being with these students today. So it's a real honor for me to be here. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Eller. We appreciate you taking time out of your, your busy day to uh, share with these students a, you know, a very powerful message that you shared earlier as well. Um, what we're going to do, students, and, and, and we are going to go through uh, two questions from each site. We're going to go in the order of uh, Robbinsdale, which are the students in there. We'll go Berea, Keystone, Lake Catholic, Lorain County, and then uh, Cuyahoga Valley. We'll go in that order. We'll go from two questions from each. Uh, when I call upon your school, you can unmute your microphone at that point and ask that question. Even between your questions, just so we can eliminate any background noise or distractions for all the other schools t tuning in, even after you ask your first question, if you can mute your, mute your microphone in between your questions, just so we can eliminate any distractions. And, and, and think about this, and I've seen the questions you guys have submitted, so I, I, we're on the right track with this. Um, if you think about this, you guys are, are talking to one of the greatest football players that's ever played in the National Football League. When you think about uh, you know, some of the players today, whoever your favorite player is, they aspire to be... Uh, in Carl Eller's shoes someday. And I'd, I'd imagine if they knew more about his background, and, and many of them are learning about his background, as he just was here at the Hall of Fame and addressed every single rookie, including RG3 and uh, Andrew Luck, I think they would aspire to be uh, you know, the, the accomplished person that he has been off the field. Uh, but just to let you guys know, it's, there's, only, uh, there's been 22,000 players that have played in the National Football League since it started here in Canton, Ohio in 1920. There are only 273 members of the Pro Football of Fame. So you are talking about the, uh, you know, it's not the Hall of Good, it's not the Hall of Great. There have been a lot of great players as well, but this is the Hall of Fame. These are the very best ever uh, to play. And you guys have the opportunity to ask questions of Mr. Eller, uh, like, you know, what advice do you have? What obstacles did you face in life? What, uh, you know, you know any, any of those type of questions, you have an opportunity to learn uh, uh, from someone who has achieved. So with that being said, we're going to kick things off with the first two questions, and obviously they can't mute their microphones in between their questions because we wouldn't hear Mr. Eller. But uh, uh, Cooper High School, if you got a couple questions, go ahead with your first one there. I have a little. Um, did you have a male figure in your life? Did I have a male figure in my life? <clears throat> I did. My, my, my father was a military man. I was actually born. I hate to tell my age, but it was uh, 42. I have to be honest here. And my uh, dad went gone and then when he returned uh, my father actually died when I was a young person uh, just uh, starting high school so when I was only just being a teenager and my father passed away with an illness uh, but there were other 
male figures in my in my in my life that came along from my neighborhood and maybe we'll get a chance to talk about some of those some of those later but unfortunately my father never ever actually saw me play football because he was deceased so that's unfortunate did my own life change after I started making money in the NFL and uh, that's an excellent question uh, because my life changed drastically <laughs> I wish I could uh, I wish I could have a better answer for this but uh, I, I really don't it's, it's, it's such a different life going from uh, even college to professional football and from where I came from, and this relates back to the earlier question, you know, my family was hardworking, you know, but they had very little extra cash. In fact, I went to college on an athletic scholarship, so having extra money was very rare in my whole upbringing, you know. And so when I signed a contract, I mean, I made more money. It was like in one year than probably my family made in a lifetime. But it's still, it doesn't even compare to what players make today. And I really had, uh, I, I couldn't even anticipate the kind of money that I was uh, making then. And so it's quite an adjustment. And uh, boy, there's some hard lessons to learn in, in that process. So uh, yeah, it changed my life, changed my attitude, changed, it changed everything. But it, it was a very abrupt change. One day I was poor, the next day I was rich. Great two questions to start off with. Thank you, Cooper High School. And we're going to go to our friends in Berea, Berea High School, home of the Browns training camp. Uh, what kind of character traits do you need to play professional football? What was that again? What kind of what? Character traits do you need to play professional football? Well, you know, if you use these pillars of character, I think that they are very much in line with uh, w with the qualities and, and values that you need as a professional football player. I just want to remind you that I, I, I see you guys are in your jerseys there and you're all uh, geared up. Must be game day there. But the point is, is that I think these characteristics start early, you know, and one is hard work. Um, and probably another one is, is belief in yourself. And, and I say that kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek because I don't think I started out with a lot of confidence. That was something that I developed over the years and through play and through participation and through competition. I gained confidence It was a, it, in reality it was a, by going against the other guys. When I would go against the other guys, if I measured up to those guys, my confidence increased. And of course, that became a real driving force for me, was to always be better than, than the other guy, or be better than the opponent. And as I came up the ladder, that's, that's how my confidence, and that was one of my main uh, character, characteristics. Go ahead, Rhea, if you have another. Yeah. Did you find it difficult to live up to expectations of being a professional football player? Um, well, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of different, really, uh, because I don't think I knew what those expectations were. Um, there's kind of a vagueness. You know, there's a lot of things about being a role model and, and uh, you know, but you really didn't have an understanding of what that was. That was something that I learned later and, and on my own. And I realized one of the things that I think that I learned that people do look up to you because being a professional football player in the National Football League, it's an achievement that most people only dream of. And so just um, uh, vicariously, they, 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 they admire you and they envy you. And me, my success came as a result of hard work. And it seemed like a lot of people that I met just put dreams and imagination out of their realm of possibilities. And so they would look at me and, and, um, and uh, treat me as uh, someone that was special, which I enjoyed that part. But, I, but, it, but it meant in some way that they took themselves out of the realm of possibility. Oh, well, I could ne you know, you're great, but I could never be that. And that, that confused me quite a bit. I, I didn't quite 
understand that you know so hopefully that kind of man and with that came the responsibility of being this role model you know so there are almost two separate things you know it's like when people look up to you you know people look up to you and admire you it really almost automatically gives you a responsibility because what you do or what I did uh, a, a lot of times it would influence some of their decisions which to me doesn't really make a lot of sense but it's true and it works that way and we'll probably hear another bell or two as we come along they're just changing class we are in school <laughs> we are in, in the classroom so you guys are familiar with that but hopefully that <laughs> answered your question thank you thank you Carl for pointing that out and thank you Bria for the, for the great question and, and I think you know that brings up a good point for you guys too you know you talk about um, uh, Carl, but you guys are role models in your schools. There are folks, your peers, that look up to you because you know you're you're in athletics. There are your you know your your sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. I remember being a fifth, sixth, seventh grader looking up to um, the high school basketball players and the high school football players. Uh, so you guys are role models. So those pillars are, are very important in your lives too. It's not just when they get in the National Football League. You guys have an influence, and I think it's important to bring that up because I see a lot of different football players and, and, and teammates in there that um, you're in a position, especially in, uh, most of you are in Ohio. Obviously, we know how big football is in Northeast Ohio and uh, throughout the state. Is that uh, you know people uh, look up to you because you are a, a, a football player, and, and that, with that comes responsibility of you guys to. Uh, not only conduct yourselves given 100% on the field, but given 100% off the field. And uh, watching, you know, what you're, what you're getting yourself into on and off the field is very important. Uh, thank you, uh, Bria. Let's go to Keystone High School. Why do you run drug and alcohol abuse clinics? Why did I run uh, drug and alcohol abuse clinics? Well, one thing, unfortunately, was that I had some difficulty with that myself. So it was through my own life experiences and, and, and being able to, to overcome that that made me realize that certainly that uh, pitfall could be out there for other people. And so I did a lot of work in prevention and, of course, in counseling. But the idea was I think that most people uh, are not aware of the resources that are out there or are they aware of how to deal with it. And, uh, uh, you know, I think it's really important to realize that uh, people do have problems and there are many times obstacles that are too difficult for them to overcome personally. So uh, there is help out there and that's what's important is that, you know, if you have problems, the thing to do, and, and this is really tough to do, so I'm, I'm familiar with that, it's to find that person or find that, you know, comrade or, or friend or something or parent that you can talk to, teacher that you can go to and ask and, and ask for help because I, I think it's unfortunate a lot of times and we certainly hear about it today where children uh, or uh, young adults or teenagers that are in this quiet isolation and they're suffering from whatever it is that they're dealing with and they really don't the, the help is there, they just don't access it. And so that's, that's been a real goal of mine. And it doesn't just uh, happen with young people. It's, it's something that people deal with all their life. Is if there's a problem, uh, is there help? And the, question, and the answer to that question is yes, there is help. Great question. Great response to you. So thank you. Uh, another one, Keystone? How did you manage to stay out of trouble in order to become successful? Well, that's another question. I think it's kind of related a little bit to, to the previous one. Uh, is that first of all, football became a, a very important, sports in general became very important in my life. And in fact, it, it, I would say that it probably rescued me at a very young age because as I explained uh, earlier is I, I was attracted to uh, a group that was very negative but they influenced me because it was a group I could belong to and we think we find I know for sure we find that often today where the requirements I mean you can join these groups a gang or whatever or a group that's dropping out of school because they don't require anything of you you just go along with the situation and 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 because of that 
I found myself fitting in with that group and 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 ultimately i separated from that group and started doing positive things as a result of getting involved with sports so sports rescued me at an earlier age but uh, uh unfortunately like later on in life i, I kind of succumbed to some other temptations you know temporarily kind of uh, set me back but uh, the great thing that i can say now is is that i certainly learned from those experiences and my life is uh, i have a quality of life now uh that uh, that i just couldn't believe so my life has changed drastically and i'm very very fortunate about that great questions there keystone let's go to menor ohio uh lake catholic oh Obviously, hard work was required to achieve your career goals. Was there ever a time when you wanted to give up? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, in athletics, I think that that's part of the, uh, the, you know, that's part of the journey. You have to push yourself. You have to test yourself. And there were many, I won't say there were many times, but certainly there were several times where I wanted to give up. Uh, I remember one time way back in college, we had this, uh, uh, we had to report, we had to run a mile. Now, I'm a big guy, I'm a lineman, typically don't run the mile. And uh, I came in and, and the coach was upset with me for some reason, uh, and he wanted me to do it again. And I didn't want to do it because I had trained so hard to, to do it, to make it the first time. And I wasn't even sure I could be successful doing it again. And so uh, that was something I, I, you know, moaned and groaned about this. I don't want to do it, you know, and all that stuff. And the coach just basically said, well, this is what you got to do in order to stay on, on the team. And, uh, boy, I, I, I obviously wanted to stay on the team. But, you know, that says uh, uh, two things. One is that the coach himself was a man of principle. He wasn't about to make excuses or exceptions for me. In other words, because I was one of the key players, there was no easy road. I really learned from that myself. That was a great lesson for me. And, and the other part of that was is that, you know, when you mess up, you, 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 got, you got to pay up. You know, there's, you know, if you make a mistake, you got to correct it. And, and that's what I did, and, and the life went on. So there was a valuable lesson for me there in, in, in a couple of different ways. Thank you for your question. Yeah, great questions today. Uh, Lake, if you got another one, go ahead. Go ahead, Pat. What was the most memorable ex experience in your life? Well, what was the most, you know, probably my kids, you know, and the birth of my kids and all of my kids throughout. It's, you know, um, you know, I'm a parent, and obviously you guys, uh, you guys aren't at this time, and you're dealing with your parents, and you're wondering why your parents are dealing with you the way they are. It's 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 a it's a great thing being a parent, but I can enjoy it now because my kids are adults, and I know for me the pleasure I had when they were young kids, and the things that we had to do. Many of them they didn't like, like study and do the homework, and stay in class, and go to school, and all those things that we talk to them about and, and insisted that they do because uh, uh, a parent and I think is a very difficult job, but the, but the most important job is to be there and to, and, and to be available to your kids. And uh, now I'm a grandparent and I can see them doing the same thing, so I'm feeling really, really good about that. That's kind of an overall thing, but in playing, you know, and in, in, in sports, uh, being successful on the field and, and being rewarded with uh, getting into the Hall of Fame. I mean, those are, those are wonderful achievements, things I'm really proud of. But uh, really, they, they're, they're on that level with... Uh, and being a parent is not necessarily an accomplishment, <laughs> but you do have to be a parent, so th that's part of it. And, 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 but by doing that, I can enjoy what was laid uh, in their early years. So that brings me enjoyment, uh, you know, every day. Well, being a parent is definitely work. <laughs> so, oh, for sure. Non-stop non work, non-stop work. So thank you, uh, Lake Catholic. Uh, let's go to Overland to Lorain County JVS. Got a couple questions. Go with you first. Yeah, what life lessons have you learned while playing in the NFL? 
One of the life lessons I think that I've learned that sticks with me today, and I think it's one of the one of the big things that I got out of football and out of sports in general is is that as a football player, you learn to face obstacles, and sometimes those obstacles seem insurmountable. And what I mean by that is is that Bob Brown, who's another Hall of Famer, we we we, we graduated uh, from college in the same year, and we went into the Hall of Fame in the same year. So our careers parallel. So he was an offensive tackle. I was a defensive end. Means that we played against each other from college and pros, and you know on and on. And he was a tough guy. You know, he was the kind of guy. He wasn't satisfied with just having a block. He wanted to put you in the ground. So. In the early, well, all through my career, he was really tough to face. And so uh, uh, we probably drew even on our matches. I know sometimes I won and then sometimes he won. But the idea that I'm trying to get across is that there are obstacles out there that are very challenging and sometimes fearful even. But you have to face those obstacles. And by facing them, you overcome them. And so as an athlete, I feel like I can look at a situation, and, and if it's challenging, I can prepare myself to meet those challenges and eventually overcome them. Another great question. Thank you, Lorraine County. If you have another one, go ahead. Hi, um, do you have any advice for young players that want to play sports when they get older? Uh, my advice to young players who want to play sports, and I, I do promote sports, you know, and I think that sports are a great, uh, you know, addition to your, to your life and lifestyle and to your, your development. But the critical thing about sports is sports don't last very long, regardless of how good you are, even if you're a Hall of Famer. So you must prepare for life after athletics or life after sports. And the thing that I've done, I, and one of the things that I am doing now is I have a program called Game Plan 2, which means, and, and this comes from sports because I found guys commit themselves so totally to sports that they forget other areas of their life, which unfortunately leaves them unbalanced. So there are other areas that they need to, to really work on. But regardless, your sports career will only last so long, so you need to have a time or prepare for a time after sports. And the other thing I want to add to that is that sports becomes a real pinnacle that you shoot for. If you get in the NFL, you can be successful. But again, that doesn't last very long. You need to look for other things where you can have success because you go on through life and you can have other goals and other pursuits, things that will, uh, that will reward you uh, just as well. Thank you very much, Lorraine County, and go to mute there. Let's go to, uh, let's, uh, hopefully we're not having any audio issues there now, but let's go to Cuyahoga Valley Career Center. Okay, Jake. Mr. Eller, a lot of the young kids' dreams of playing in the NFL, when did you start playing, and when did you seriously think you could really play in the NFL? Okay, that's another excellent question. I, I think I got involved in the sports late. It was probably, I was already in high school, and I mean, I played sandlot ball and in the park, and that was fun. But I really didn't play organized sports until I was a, about a sophomore in, in high school. And um, so I didn't have all that confidence. As I said earlier, I gained confidence by improving my skills. And, and at every level where I was successful, that prompted me to move on to the next level. So I was successful in high school. I was on a team that was successful. We were state champions. I was all state. And so then that encouraged me and supported the idea of, well, going on to college. And, of course, getting a college scholarship was, was, was important. But I had doubts that I could play at the college level. But I proved myself by facing the competition and, uh, and I did the same thing in professional sports. So unlike young kids today growing up with the idea, I'm going to become a professional athlete, there's a long road <laughs> between, you know, here and there. There's no way you can predict that. It's just impossible. And so what I would suggest is, is that be successful at the level you are. 
if you're at the top of the heap there i mean if you're not playing on your high school team that should really tell you something you know it doesn't mean that you can or you want but if you're not successful at that level you will likely not be successful at the next level so you have to take success to build on success and that's where my dreams of playing pro football came from people recognizing that i could compete in the and i established myself you know at whatever level that i was that was that i was at at that time and go ahead kind of rally your audio is coming through crystal clear Mr. Eller, players in the players today in the NFL are so much bigger than when you played. So, how would you think you would do if you played today in the NFL? <laughs> I wipe them out. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't know. I, I, I think the playing the National Football League, particularly at my position, a defensive end, would be very challenging. I know there is a, um, I don't think it's a, a, a mistake because players are bigger, but only in certain positions. And it's mostly in the offensive line. Like offensive linemen, when I played, rarely were 300 pounds, you know, maybe in the 270s, 280s, 290s. And like Bob Brown was a 300 pounder when I played. Uh, but today, an offensive lineman would have to average over 330 pounds, 330 to 350. So it's very common. I would have to re-establish uh, my techniques or reevaluate my techniques if I were playing today, because you'd have to use a little different method. It's kind of hard to push a quarter ton around, you know. But um, uh, I think I would do well. And so you have guys in certain positions that that really don't change very much. And speed is kind of a, a de deceptive. I was a very fast, I had speed, I had agility, I had all of those things that are that are required to play my position, as, as typically as you can imagine as a Hall of Famer, you have to be good. So uh, the defensive ends are probably stature-wise, physique-wise, talent-wise, like DeMarcus Ware, those kind of guys, uh, Mario, it would be very similar in size and height and weight. It's amazing because you need those same kind of skills to, to play that position. The same with defensive backs, or, you know, they're still smaller guys, wiry guys. Receivers like uh, Randy Moss it kind of changed the game because now they're speedier, they, they can, they're taller, they're able to jump. Receiving positions, running backs, some of those positions have changed quite a bit but most drastically among the offensive line. Yeah, and I think you find that there's a, there was a uh, uh, defensive back uh, by the name of Mel Blunt that played, you know, during uh, a little bit after Carl's time, but very close in the Carl's era. And he was, he was a, 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 a um, defensive back that was, you know, 6'2", 215, which is very comparable to today, or even bigger than a lot of guys today, obviously, uh, in that same position. So, yeah, it's exactly right. That offensive line has has really evolved <laughs> since that time. But um, thank you, Cuyahoga Valley Career Center. What we're going to do is we're going to go back through and cycle through each of these schools again, start from the top with Robbinsdale. We'll just go from one question from each site, and it looks like we have about uh, a little over 20 minutes left, so we'll go through as many, many as we can. So go ahead there, Robbinsdale. Over here, here's one. Was it a hard time to balance your football career while also trying to be in the parent? Uh, the question is, did I have a hard time balancing my football career and being a parent? And the answer is yes. And, and the answer is yes because as a football player, there are certain things that go along with the, with the job itself. You know, there's travel, there's training, there's all those kinds of things. And the one thing that I think that's the toughest about being a football player is, is that it really does consume you, you know, and, and I don't think that many people realize how difficult that is, the intensity of the sport. In other words, I go from Sunday to, you know, or let's say from Monday to Sunday, and my mind would totally concentrate on my opponent or, or, or that guy that I was going to play that week. So mentally, you were, you were not really available. And, and, and that's a cost that parents 
uh, you know, or families have to pay. But, um, you know, you have the off-season, which you compensate, and so you can spend time. We go to trips, and we could do things like that. But, but man, it's really hard. I think it's hard on families because these football players are so intense. You're so consumed uh, because the level of competition is, like, so high. You can't really afford to make a mistake or, or you know, because it could be your job or your career. So I think that the families do suffer from that, and, I, and I'm sure that my family did as well. And so when I talk about being a parenting, it's like going back and enjoying those moments that I had then, but also now that I can, I can spend time with my kids and my grandkids. So that's... It's almost like in spite of the fact that I was a football player, my kids really turned out okay, and they were, they were good kids, and they were kids I'm really proud of. And, of course, their mom had a lot to do with it. I can't take all the credit, or I shouldn't take very much of the credit, actually. But, but no, it is, it is nice, and, and I'm just very happy and fortunate that my kids are, are you know, are really good kids, and, and, and they're fortunate, too, that, uh, you know, from the football experience that we're getting it chance to enjoy a lot of things that football uh, offered them, offered us as a family. Great question. Thank you very much, Rob and Scott. Let's go back to Berea. Is there any specific game that you remember the most? Okay. My high school homecoming. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> No, well, you remember a lot of games, and and really the thrill of uh, playing high school is kind of where it all starts, you know, and it's a fun time. It's a time to really, uh, you know, set your sails, I suppose. But, uh, you know, there were a few games that I remember uh, that, that stand out. I think the game against the uh, Los Angeles Rams when I uh, tackled Roman Gabriel uh, for a safety in, in, in the end zone in that game. And that gave us the margin that we were able to win that game, and we went to our first Super Bowl. And I remember I talked about Bob Brown. I was playing against Bob Brown, so it kind of made it a double thing. And Bob's a guy. I don't hate Bob, <laughs> but he was so tough that, you know, beating him was like, hey, I beat one of the best guys and made this, made this play. So uh, that's, uh, I have a lot of respect for him. He's a good friend. But that was a great play in my career. Okay, thank you, Berea. And let's go to uh, Keystone. <clears throat> Do you believe sports develop character or expose it? Well, I believe sports develop character. And what was the last half of that question? Or expose it. Oh, okay. Uh, well, in my case, I think sports develops character. Um, it's a good question, a good way to, to frame it. I think because it challenges you, you know, and it challenges your character. Uh, and maybe in some ways it exposes your character because if you're not strong, if you don't have a good core, it will expose your weaknesses and it will expose your, your frailties. So uh, I think sports develop it because the one thing is that when you play sports, you're in the spotlight. You know, it may not be a big stadium or TV or something like that. But on the field of competition, there's really no place to hide. So if there's fear, you know, it's going to show. And you can't be afraid when that guy is across you. You have to stand up and match that guy. I think it really develops a character. Thank you very much, Keystone. Let's go to uh, Lake, Lake Catholic. Go ahead. Uh, yes, no, you're up. Go out of the six pillars of character, which one helped you through your most difficult situation? Uh, well, well, well I, I think there were some things that are just kind of natural, as Jerry mentioned in the, in the beginning of, the, of this uh, show, uh, was that things like citizenship and caring, I think that those are important. You know, to care for your fellow man or your teammate or whatever, and uh, I think that that's that's important. I think citizenship is important because we all play a part in you know in our communities and the kind of communities we live in, and uh, we all have a responsibility to that. We have a responsibility 
to what our life is like. And I know a lot of people, and you hear this, and particularly now, is that somebody else is to blame for our situation and, and the environment that we live in. We cannot live in that environment unless we accept it, and we have the ability and the responsibility to do something about that. So whatever environment we live in, we have to share some of that responsibility for, for whatever that is. And uh, uh, maybe one man or one woman can't make a change, but that's where it starts. And so those are, uh, those are important. I was going to share with you the one on respect. I have a little different definition here. And uh, when I talk about respect, as, as in, the, in the pillars of character, it says uh, respect is needed by each of us in order to be able to live with ourselves, to avoid those attitudes and behavior which would make others resist or avoid us, to develop the human models we would want to be like, to have those we can admire and look up to and relate to our own goals, ambition, and drives. So respect, I think, uh, even though uh, we pointed those others, I think respect is important because you want people to respect you, and 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 you want to be around people that you respect, you know, and that's a mutual thing. It's almost like you know, likes attract or something like that. But I, I and I think the respect is kind of misunderstood. Respect is not because I'm tougher than you or I'm. Uh, you know, got more money than you or something like that. Respect is something that you earn by the person you are, and, and, and you develop that from within. Thank you very much, Lake Catholic. Let's go to uh, Lorraine County. Were there any coaches that influenced your career more than others? Were there any coaches that influenced my career? Well, my coaches were a big influence on my career, and... Uh, I think coaches, you know, choose that profession uh, because they have a love for it and, and, and obviously they feel like they can make a difference. All of my coaches did. In high school, I played for a coach. Uh, his name was Ben Warren. And, and I'm going to share a, a short story with you uh, uh, about my high school coach, Coach Warren. You know, when I got, my, when I got inducted in the, into the Hall of Fame, uh, my coach called me, and he left a, a message on my voicemail. And this was like, I'm, I, I graduated from high school in 1960. I mean, it was so uh, emotional that I couldn't call him right back because it, it, it almost makes me emotional now because here was a guy that took a chance on me. I mean, he didn't even know me. I mean, you know what I mean? He had no idea. So he really put his, uh, uh, he, 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 he put himself out there for me, and he, and, he, and he took a chance on me when I wasn't obviously a star, didn't know anything about football. So I think that this guy, by having faith and confidence in me, uh, had a great influence on me, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I think that he probably more than any uh, really influenced me because that's where I got my start and, and I obviously was a nobody and just a lanky kid running the streets of Winston-Salem, North Carolina But and, and I really appreciate that. Thank you, Lorraine County. And let's go to Cuyahoga Valley. Mr. Eller, what made you get into football? Was it suggested by like a fam close friend or family? And you're a really tall guy. Was there other sports you wanted to do besides bas or besides football, like basketball? Well, Jerry, I don't know where you got this audience from, but boy, they're asking <laughs> some tough questions today, and uh, all the good ones too. <laughs> you're almost embarrassing me here. You're gonna make me blush, but I <laughs> I kind of explain this a little bit, sort of a beating around the bush, but. Before I got into sports, I was not the best student, and uh, I was disciplined, actually, a couple times, and finally, and I went to the principal's office, the principal said, well, Carl, if you don't change your behavior, you know, if you don't straighten out your ways, uh, you're going to get kicked out of school, 
And at that point, high school was not very enjoyable for me because, like I said, I didn't have a lot of friends. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't some guy that people liked or whatever. It just, it was a horrible experience. And he, and, uh, and he said, well, you ought to get involved with football and, uh, you know, use some of that energy in a good way, in a positive way. So that really kind of got me started. I mean, I thought, well, you know, this is the principle. Maybe I can get on his good side and... You know, I mean, that was kind of a crazy way to get started, but that's how I got started and took off from there. You know, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to say, Carl, that it's uh, all the old, great Ohio schools, being that I'm a born and bred Ohioan as well, but uh, we had great questions in the last program for schools from other states, too. So I guess we can't take all the credit here in Ohio for being uh, wonderful students, because there's a gr group of great students asking questions right beside you in uh, Minnesota. So... Um, but we've got time. Uh, we'll try to rotate through maybe one more time if we can. Robbinsdale, if you have another question. Let me, uh, Jerry, I wanted to do this in the last show. Is I want to ask them a question. Uh, maybe I'll ask this group a question. And they, there's been no prep for this, but I'm going to ask them. Anybody can answer. What's, uh, what's your biggest challenge here in uh, school today? What do you find uh, the things that challenge you? What kinds of difficulties do you run across? Where is it? Is it in the classroom? Is it in, you know, playground or where? Just anybody? If any of the other yeah, schools are on mute, okay. Go ahead. Uh, like some of my difficulties is like in school. Like, like I really don't enjoy like science and and geography and stuff like that. But I gotta get it done, so I, I try to push myself. Okay, so he's saying his challenges are in the classroom. And, and that's a good point, you know, because um, uh, some st people in general have a, uh, 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 a tenacity to be good at certain things, you know. And, uh, and school really forces you to have a broader outlook, you know. Not outlook is probably not the right word, but things that may be on this easy for you. And so... What you have to do, and this is my piece of advice, is to really spend time in those things that are difficult for you. Because those will be the things that will challenge you later on. It's like math, particularly, and I was not really good at math, but it is something that if you master now, it's, it's going to help you. And that's just not a fair tale. So don't, particularly the things that are hard, don't avoid those things. Those are the areas where you need to work. And, and, uh, and those will be the areas that will pay off later on. So, uh, but that was an excellent question. Thank you for that. And any other schools want to, well, we can let you unmute the mic if some, one of the other schools wanted to give something that they, they have struggled with. Yeah. Go ahead, David. Are you, have you ever got bullied for in high school? And you have any advice of people get bullied? Man, I quit, Jerry. <laughs> I know. I know. These, these kids are good. These, are, these young men are good. These, right. these questions are too tough for me, man. <clears throat> you sure you didn't plant some of these guys in there somewhere? But, but no, these are great questions. And, and actually, you're making me remember things that I haven't even thought about, like, for years. Because when I went to high school, Winston-Salem was my hometown. Atkins High School is my high school. But I transferred from a school called... Columbia Heights School, which was like a middle school or whatever, elementary school. And they had this reputation, you know, like, oh, man, when you go to high school, they're going to really get you, man. They, and they had a guy that was a big guy, and I'm a big guy, but this is a big guy, and his name was Chicken Wing. <laughs> and they called him Chicken Wing because he had something wrong with his arm. But they had this story, man, that this guy was going to get you under his arm. It was just going to, like, really menace you and choke you and beat you up and all that stuff. Man, I was, like, so scared, man. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, it was. But I avoided that guy. I knew who he was. I didn't go around him. And so I avoided that guy. So maybe that's a method. But the thing is, is that... Um, you know, the way I think about bullying, and I know they're addressing this on classes and on campuses and all that stuff th today, I think bullying is part of a test. 
You know, I don't see bullying as bad. And I know maybe I'm going to kick me out of the classroom right now, you know. But the point is, is that you're going to get tested somewhere, some way. You know, and you can't always back down or run away. I'm not saying fight or do something like that. But the bullying is to really test your mettle, let's say, what it is. And, and what it does is it makes you basically step up. Either you got it or you don't. Now, if somebody will say that's unfair or that you shouldn't be challenged that way, I'm not of that school. I'm saying that life itself challenges you. And you don't know where you got. You could call life a bully just because something is unpleasant or I don't agree with it or it's hard for me or that it's not my cup of tea, should I avoid it? I don't, have, I don't share that philosophy. I share you deal with problems as they come, and you learn to overcome those problems as you face them. Thank you very that's, that's much, a, sir. That's a great point, Carl. That is a wonderful point, uh, and I, I, I tend to agree with your philosophy as well. Uh, does anybody else have one that they wanted to throw out there, another issue that they uh, face? Well, just we, back on the football field standpoint, obviously we know he's the best defensive lineman of all time. We want to hey, know, right. who, yeah, we want to know who, in his opinion, is the best running back of all time. On a lighter oh. note, <laughs> what, what was that comment that I heard? Who, who did you suggest over there? Did I hear a name? I, I just want to know, you're the best defensive lineman. I want to know who the best running back is. Of Jim all Brown. Time. Jim Brown. Uh, that's what I thought I heard, yeah. Okay, well, Jim Brown is certainly one of them and probably might be the best running back. I did get a chance to play against Jim Brown uh, at the latter part of his career. Our careers sort of overlap there. And uh, he gets a lot of respect and is typically thought of as certainly being one of the best. He's kind of a guy, uh, he followed a guy named Marion Motley, and you probably know that name in Ohio because he played for the Cleveland Browns too. Uh, but uh, Jim Brown was one of the better ones. I think that Gail Sears was one of the better ones because he was speedy and quick, and if he got past the line of scrimmage, he would just, it, it was hard to bring him down. I mean, we would actually sit in our, you know, uh, 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 training rooms or our study rooms where we watch films, and we'd say, well, wow, look, at, we were amazed as, as the opponent team that we were going to play it was all like, wow, that guy is amazing because he would do such incredible things on the field, uh, things that even we hadn't seen before. So uh, uh, Gail is certainly up there with Jim Brown, uh, guys like uh, Tony Dorsett or Franco Harris. I can name a lot of them. Our own Chuck Foreman was a great running back. Uh, you know, there are a lot. Each, each period brings along a style, a player, you know, that's, uh, that, you know, that's up there and that quality and – and, uh, you know, the, the, the national, one thing great about the National Football League is that when you play in the National Football League, you realize how great these guys are. It's not, it's not hype. So, yeah, there are a lot of great ones. I think these Ohio schools were setting you up, Carl. They wanted you to say Jim Brown, just to, uh, uh, yeah, Browns, I, I, you know, okay. they were, they were setting you up for the, for the Cleveland Brown uh, shout out. But, uh, uh, Mr. Eller, I know we've, we've covered a lot of different things here today, and we got just a couple of minutes left. Are there any closing remarks, either something you've shared or some, you know, something you'd like to reiterate or something we haven't talked about that you'd like to share with these students today? Well, uh, first of all, Jerry, I want to thank you and the whole crew for putting this together. This has been great for me, wonderful, and the questions were very uh, challenging, actually, uh, because they reminded me of things I haven't thought about in both sessions today, and, and so I want to compliment the students in this session, in this classroom, and the other classrooms for their preparation and, uh, and all the work that they have done uh, you know, I just have great uh, faith and confidence in, uh, in our students of today. Uh, what The word I want to leave with them. Good then. afternoon, Cooper students and staff. Uh, please excuse the interruption. I'd of like course. to make a few announcements uh, <laughs> prior to our pep fest here this afternoon. First of all, I'd like to remind everyone that if you need to go to your lockers, you will only be allowed to do so between Hopefully seven Hopefully this isn't a 10-minute announcement. Hours. You won't be allowed to go to your lockers or we will miss you for the path test. So if you need to go take some, put some things in your locker or pick some things up, please do it then. We will dismiss you by floors this afternoon. And when you enter the gym, please look for your grade level sign as to where you should sit. 
Also remember to be respectful as we cheer our team on. Respect. There we Tomorrow's go. Tomorrow's festivities will kick off at 12 noon <laughs> with tailgating. It's going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be a lot of activities going on. The game will begin at 3 p.m. The cost is $4 for students. The homecoming dance will start at 7 p.m. The cost is $11. You must be a Cooper student to attend, and you need to arrive by 8 p.m. to enter. And remember, go Hawks! <laughs> well, there we go. That was great timing. <laughs> but go ahead. Finish your thoughts there, Mr. Ella. Uh, yeah, I think my thought was is that uh, the, the thought I want to leave with is that, you know, as I've gone through life, I've learned uh, that uh, life is always rewarding. It's always exciting. You know, there are certainly ups and downs. But, but all in all, I mean, life is exciting and challenging. I continue to learn. I continue to accept challenges and, uh, and uh, really just have confidence in yourself, really believe in yourself. Not that you know it all and you have it all, because I don't think anybody does, but that you have the capabilities of learning, changing, developing, becoming the person that you really want to be. And, and, and every one of these students, wherever they are, have that potential and have that capability. And I can tell you, I, I kind of walk away from today with these groups of students that we've that we've had here today. Just you know, the, the caliber of questions and the preparation is just a sign of, of the, the type of character that these students and these teachers have. So I walk away with a good feeling of our of our youth today, just from uh, you know the schools that we've connected with. I don't know if you feel that same way from this. I certainly do. Uh, they're, they're just been wonderful. I mean, uh, everything has been fantastic. Again, back to the work of putting this together, I think it's a great opportunity for kids to connect or young people to connect. And I, too, am walking away with a lot. So I've learned a lot here today. Well, uh, Mr. Eller, on behalf of the Hall of Fame and myself and uh, Steve Perry and everybody else here that you know very well, um, I just want to say thank you for taking time out of your day for, um, uh, you know, spending time with these students and sharing a really, a really uh, powerful message um, to these students. And students, if you want to join me for, for the time being here and unmute your microphones and join me in saying thank you and giving a round of applause to Pro Football. Hey, 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 hey. You, uh, you know, again, thank you to Robbinsdale School District, Cooper High School, the folks at ETEC, all the schools that participated, uh, Berea and Keystone Lake Catholic, Lorain County, uh, Cuyahoga Valley Career Center, and, and Robbinsdale, obviously, as well. Um, thank you for uh, the connection today. Thank you for the teachers for preparing them. And uh, uh, hopefully we get the uh, – most of you may have been here before, but hopefully you make the trek here to Canton, Ohio, to see the pro football game someday. Uh, but if not, take care, and this, this concludes our program. Thank you.